Can everyone see the full length of the title and the slides, hopefully? I'll try and keep a lookout for the chat, but we've got one of our lovely committee members um, looking after the chat also. So just let us know if you have any issues. I'll just check to make sure it's all okay. Hopefully you guys can see that. Okay, brilliant. Good. Right, so lovely to meet you all virtually. I'm so sorry that it's in this manner that we meet and not at some lovely conference or something, but this is probably actually more convenient most of you to, and probably less effort to come to. So my name's Yarrow. Um, I'm, I'm an academic foundation doctor based at Brighton currently. Um, I, I rotated through medical school at Southampton and I probably back then fell in love with ophthalmology when I did one of my student modules in ophthalmology, just because I think it's quite a niche specialty, um, less acute and quite practical as well as medicine heavy. So it's quite a good blend of everything, to be honest. So I'd highly recommend to anyone who's aspiring to be an ophthalmologist to consider it and try and do your best um, to explore the specialty altogether. And stuff like this teaching is second nature to be honest with me because I love it so much and I'm happy to commit my time when it comes to teaching students um, who are keen so thank you everyone to attend for attending this course okay the first lesson we'll have to try and get everyone up to scratch with the Duke Elder which can sometimes seem like quite an intimidating exam um, is on anatomy okay so the first lesson will be about anatomy We've got a few shameless plugs in that corner. So have a look at those if you want to stay abreast with how our schedule goes, okay? And any news or any stuff we share resources wise with you guys, okay? Um, otherwise, without further ado, I'm going to try and introduce the course a bit more. So it's a free course. Um, it's taught by clinical tutors who are motivated to firstly learn the content themselves because a lot of them will be hopefully practicing in the field soon. It's evidence-based, so we're going to be trialing a few new techniques that we thought might be useful for you guys as students, just to kind of break it up in terms of how didactic teaching normally is done. And we hopefully, if you guys complete all the sessions or a vast majority of the sessions, we hopefully can provide you a certificate to say that you've attended the course and hopefully give you the confidence to at least pass this exam, which although it seems difficult, if you know the basic content and a bit more than your normal medical school content that is taught on your rotations, then you have a high chance of passing it, to be honest. If you wanna smash this exam, that's a bit harder and you have to prepare a bit more, but we can talk about that later on. Our committee consists of myself, um, an F2 doctor. We have Tom, who's taking an F3 year out and he's a clinical fellow also based in Brighton. And then we have Razia, who's a, another F3 doctor who's taking a clinical fellow year out. And she's actually spent most of her time and she's joined us today in Sussex Eye Hospital as an honorary fellow, um, shadowing the department and having a look at the various intricacies that the department offers, okay? So there's three of us who are trying to run this course and we'll each tackle individual lessons, including anatomy for me today. Okay, if you have any questions for us, please feel free to get in contact with any of us or go to our kind of social media presses. So today's learning outcomes, I can't stress enough, is based on the Royal College of Ophthalmologists undergraduate and foundation doctor syllabus. If you guys haven't seen this yet, I highly recommend touching base with it because it provides a very solid foundation as to where and how to place your learning in the grand scheme of things and how to structure things. They talk through the basic principles of anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, and the clinical side of ophthalmology. And I think that's a very good starting point to try and structure your revision, okay? There isn't really an official curriculum per se for the Duke Elder, but the college are adamant in saying that as long as you do your clinical rotations in um, medical school, which obviously have been affected unfortunately by the pandemic, you'll be in a very good position to pass the Duke Elder. But I think, unfortunately, that's not enough, sadly, because we only get to spend about five working days in ophthalmology to try and grasp the basic principles, yet alone the more intricate facts and stuff that get tested in Duke Elder. The Duke Elder, if anything, is more, more similar to the part one exam for entry into ophthalmology, 
which is highly over the top and not necessary information for students who are trying to just sit the exam at an undergraduate level. So if anything, I think you have to go a bit beyond the medical school curriculum, but the Royal College do try and stick to their own curriculum in terms of what they test on this exam. Okay, so this is a good place to start and it's never, it doesn't always equal what your medical school teaches you. So that's why I'd recommend going there first before you go to your medical school curriculum. Okay, obviously to be a safe and competent doctor, you just need to know probably the emergencies that are associated with ophthalmology rather than any more level detail. But if you want to pass the Duke Elder, feel free to tune into our course. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about the anatomy of the eye in the orbit, okay, as a global structure. We'll then talk about the vasculature, okay, and how it relates to some of the common ocular disorders we see. We'll talk about the anatomy of neuronal pathways um, to the pupil and beyond into the cortex. And we'll talk about the extraocular muscles that supply the eyes and the associated cranial nerve palsies. Some of the stuff will have overlap with subsequent sessions that we cover on our course, but a lot of the stuff we'll cover as, as a foundational thing. So we'll try and build on the knowledge that we gain from lesson one, two, three, okay? A bit like a spiral curriculum, sadly. <laughs> okay, so we've talked about the questions. Everyone's done the pre-MCQ and everyone's had a look at the video. So fantastic news, well done, okay? Um, so, um, and so I've seen some people in the chat. The dates for the sessions can be found on our website just down below. Um, and then, yeah, Yasmin's answered the <laughs> fantastic. So the dates can be found on our website. Okay, so anatomy of the eye in orbit, okay? When we're talking about the anatomy of the eye in orbit, this is obviously quite a broad structure that's considered of multiple kind of substructures inside, okay? So we'll talk about the global organization, talk about the bones that form the orb orbit, talk about the eyelids, the lacrimal system, the cornea, the conjunctiva, before we dive into the eye, okay? So the overall structure of the eye, um, it seems complicated on the outside, okay? Like this squishy substance that's circular in nature and provides us vision. And it's a very complicated structure internally, to be honest, because it's been refined over centuries of evolution to form a very sophisticated visual system that can not only digest information that's in front of us, but also filter information change towards light settings, um, towards different type of stimuli, as well as optimize for the environmental conditions that are present around the world. So it's a very sophisticated structure. I know I'm teaching you guys to suck eggs by this, but we'll start from basic principles. In order to perceive a stimulus, sight is one of the five senses, and to perceive a visible stimulus, you unfortunately need light light from the sun or from any other object or source will bounce off rays on an object and those objects will, will produce their own rays that are identified as perceptive fields within our vision, okay? And that's how we interpret color, black and white, motion, you name it, okay? It's through light bouncing off objects that then give their own wave pattern to that light or that energy form, okay? When it comes into our eye, it travels through quite a few structures before it gets to the back of the retina, okay? Namely, at the very start, it probably travels through the tear film, okay? And then it gets through the cornea, okay? The aqueous chamber or the aqueous humor as well as the anterior chamber, then through a lens, okay? And then through the vitreous humor as well as to eventually towards the retina. And when we get to the retina, quite a magical process occurs. I put magical in inverted commas. But a magical process occurs where there is this element of phototransduction where the light energy source gets converted into a chemical impulse or a neurochemical impulse. And we have an action potential that's initiated from the back of the retina and is sent further down the optic tract or down to our kind of brain to interpret the signal that we're seeing, the visual response that we're seeing. Okay. So we have the cornea, we have then the lens, and then we have the retina pretty much. That is the kind of visual pathway or the visual window, so to speak. Surprisingly, and I was shocked by this, um, the cornea does majority of the refractive, um, the refraction when it comes to the actual optics of the eye. And that's about 80% of it. The lens does 20% only, and it is there for accommodation, um, but it only does 20% of the refraction 
based on accommodation. Majority of it comes from the cornea, okay? In terms of the global structure, one way to think about it, and this is once again due to embryology, unfortunately, which I won't go into in this lecture, sadly. I don't think it gets tested as much as it should probably, but a lot of the stuff and the way we are designed is due to embryology. And in this case, there are three major layers that you need to be aware of that kind of shape the globe of the eye, okay? That is the most outermost layer, which is the fibrous tunic, okay? That is composed of the sclera and the cornea, which you can see here in blue, all right? So the outermost layer of the eye, there's usually, what the, ten, the general rule is there tends to be an anterior portion, okay? Or an anatomical portion in the anterior portion of the eye. And then it tends to be a posterior one, okay? So in this case, the cornea, once again, this is due to the embryology of the eye and how it was formed, okay, because they come from two different layers of tissue from the original kind of mesoderm, ectoderm, endoderm. The cornea is the anterior portion here, and the sclera is the posterior portion, and together they form the fibrous tunic. The cornea has quite regular connective tissue that allow it to act as a window into the vitreous and the retina, whereas the sclera is much more disorganized but highly packed dense connective tissue to help provide the structure to the eye. It's also consistent of three other layers but we'll go into that, okay? There's loads of layers in the eye and I'm so sorry for that. The middle layer is a bit like the powerhouse of the eye. It provides all the vasculature, all the venous drainage that is needed for the eye to survive and function and to feed its individual kind of subparts, if that makes sense. So the middle layer is known as the vascular tunic, okay? Carries all the vessels, carries all the venous drainage and some of the nerve supply that is necessary to feel pain um, and stimuli in the eye, okay? But the most dense part of the um, nervous system that is present in the eye is actually in the inner layer known as the neurosensory layer. And the neurosensory layer is responsible for the perception of light, okay? So there's three layers to the eye. I think this is just a good diagram to break it down, okay? So we've got the blue part, which shows the outermost fibrous tunic, and then the green part, the, um, the cornea. The cornea has five layers in total, okay, which we'll go through, and the sclera has three layers, which we'll also go through. I don't think you need to know off by heart these layers, but just knowing roughly their function and their purpose and being aware of them is probably useful, okay? As I said, the cornea has quite finely organized collagen fibers or connective tissue fibers to allow it to be an opaque window, sorry, not an opaque, a clear window into the, um, into the eye and allow light to come through. Whilst the sclera has a lot of interwound kind of connective tissue to provide it tensile strength so the globe doesn't ever rupture, okay? When it's pushed or trauma or anything like that, okay? Within reason, obviously. The middle layer consists of three subparts, um, the choroid, which provides a lot of the vasculature to the back of the retina. In fact, it's probably the most metabolic component of the eye, the choroid. The ciliary body, which is present and has zonules that attach onto the lens and allow it to do wonderful things like accommodation. So the ciliary bodies attach to the lens through zonules um, and they allow the lens to accommodate in response to parasympathetic and sympathetic responses. And the iris um, is also under the influence of parasympathetic and sympathetic responses, which we'll cover in the pharmacology of the eye, but is also present, okay, as the middle part of the layer. The final inner layer is pretty much just the neurosensory layer and it is the retina, which we'll discuss further down, okay, in the slides. And this is the sclera. These are the three layers that make up the sclera. And it's more just to do with the clinical implication that quite a lot of people who have um, bilirubinemia, okay, for whatever reason, because the sclera has this kind of network of dense connective tissue that's interwound, it's quite easy for bilirubin that travels through the choroid to kind of diffuse into the sclera. And as a result of that, you get this scleral jaundice in people who have hepatic dysfunction or say Gilbert syndrome. And it often shows through in the sclera first before it shows in other parts of the body that has connective tissue like the skin, okay? So that's the eye as a global structure, okay? Three major layers is your take home point from that, okay? The outermost layer, 
the middle layer, which is vascular in nature, and the innermost layer, which is neurosensory in nature. Okay. Now let's talk about the orbit. I've got the pyramids shown here because that is ultimately what the orbit looks like, um, a bit like that, um, in the sense that it has an apex, okay, and that is essentially the optic canal at the very end, and it has a roof, okay. So imagine if this pyramid was tilted onto its side. There's a roof at the very top. There is a wall here to the side, a medial and a lateral wall on the other side. And then there is a floor, an orbital floor, so to speak. And they reach all together at the apex to form the optic canal where the optic nerve is able to escape from to supply and to send signals to the back of the brain, okay? Unfortunately, there's no real sensible way of learning the walls of the orbit apart from just rote learning them, okay? And I apologize for that. Um, I would say that the best way to also approach this is through visual learning. So we can we can go through an, a, a quick anatomical model right now, okay? Just remember that the roof is mostly formed from the frontal bone, as well as the lesser sphenoid, which is here. Then the floor is primarily formed from the maxillary bone, okay? The palatine bone, which is inside, and the zygomatic, which is this blue one, okay? And the maxillary is the purple one. The medial wall, okay, on the innermost layer is formed from the ethmoid, which is the slightly different tinge of orange, okay, the maxillary bone, and the sphenoid again, okay, the lesser wing. The lateral wall is formed from the zygomatic, which is blue, and the greater wing of the sphenoid, which is yellow, okay? So that is how the different walls of the orbit are formed, okay? And we're just going to go for an anatomical model now, just to quickly have a look at these different walls, okay? Let me see if I can get this to work. Let's have a look. I'm going to try and do a new share quickly, just to see if this works. Can everyone see the skull model? I'm really hoping everyone can see the skull model. Oh, good, okay, fantastic. I can't believe this is working. <laughs> okay, good. So this is the skull. Um, no, no brownie points for naming that. Um, and essentially, this is the best way to visualize the orbit, okay? So if we have a look on the inside, hopefully I don't cock this up, let's have a look. Okay, so inside, and this is a very good app to be honest, because it allows you to label things. So on the lateral side, okay, the lateral side of the orbit, we have the zygomatic bone, which joins the frontal bone to form a zygofrontal suture or frontozygomatic suture, okay? And that forms the majority and the bulk of the lateral wall. Here at the back, we also have the greater wing of a sphenoid, which forms part of the lateral wall of the orbit also, but more of the inner segment, if that makes sense. So you've got the kind of frontal skull segment formed by zygomatic and frontal, and you have the greater wing of the sphenoid forming also part of the lateral wall, okay? The floor of the orbit is, is probably the weakest point, to be honest, um, and it's the most prone to trauma, especially when we get blowout fractures, but we form the floor of the orbit with the maxillary bone, parts of the ethmoid bone, and once again, parts of the sphenoid bone, okay? to form the bony and the palatine bone comes down here too. So that's, that's your floor, ultimately, the maxillary bone, ethmoid bone, and the sphenoid bone, okay? The lateral part, or sorry, the medial wall is formed from, we've got some components of the right lacrimal bone here. We have the ethmoid bone, we have the maxillary bone, and we have parts of the frontal bone that also form the medial aspect of the wall, okay? And the easiest part is probably to identify the roof of the orbit, which is majority formed from the frontal bone and a bit of the greater wing of the sphenoid, okay? So this is a good tool to just have a quick play to visually represent what we're looking at. Equally, as you can see, we talked about a pyramid in an apex, right there in the center of the sphenoid, okay? We have an optic canal, which I can't get a good angle. Oh, there, there's a good angle. We have the optic canal, oh, apologies. The optic canal, which sends the optic nerve backwards. We also have the greater orbital fissure, okay, which carries a few important blood vessels and, um, and, and nerves. And we have the inferior orbital fissure down here, okay, 
that's formed from the lesser wing of a sphenoid. And then the greater wing of the sphenoid forms the greater orbital fissure. Okay, so this is a good app to try and get your head around the actual physical anatomy. Right, back to the PowerPoint. Hopefully you guys can see the PowerPoint again. All right, good. So let's go back to the orbital wall. So clinically speaking, um, the medial orbital wall is technically the thinnest part of the orbital wall. The orbit gradually thins as you go inwards. Unfortunately, the bones all get thinner as you go inwards. But the reason why the medial wall is not most prone to fracture is because the ethmoid sinuses on the medial side help support the network. So they almost reinforce the medial wall. So if something were to go in terms of trauma, say a squash ball that was placed into someone's eye through a sporting injury, the medial wall probably would break, but it's not the most likely and vulnerable structure to break first. The floor of the orbit, unfortunately, formed by the sphenoid bone and the maxillary bone, um, and the fact that there's an inferior orbital fissure there also um, doesn't help the actual structure or the um, integrity is usually the most vulnerable to fractures. And we get these things called blowout fractures as a result of that. And blowout fractures is basically any sudden pressure within the orbit, okay, that's coming out from an outside stimulus. There's nowhere else for the actual pressure to go. So it tends to just go downwards. And that is known as a blowout fracture. And typically what you see, the best thing to see for an orbital blowout fracture so this picture is someone shining a light and asking the, the kid to look straight into the light. As you can see, the pathology is on the right-hand side. So here we can see there's kind of um, alignment between the light response and the kind of center of the pupil here. So this is the normal eye when the kid is asked to look straight into the eye. Here we have almost like a down depressed gaze. Okay, so this is where the blowout fracture has occurred. Equally here, if we ask the kid to do an up gaze, so the kid is looking upwards, okay, at something, there is no matchup of the papillary reflex um, with this eye, so they're looking upwards, and this one matches up. And that is because probably the inferior rectus is impeded in terms of its activity and is pinched, and so the kid can't actually look up as a result of it. And all the other muscles in the area from the blowout fracture have swollen up. So there is no ocular movement upwards. And this seems to be the most sensitive sign for blowout fractures. Okay, moving on to the eyelids. Um, the reason why I've popped Sir Prancelot up here, okay, your old school surgeon, okay, is because the eyelid I like to treat a bit like the abdomen. So when you go to theatre for general surgery and they ask you how many layers are we cutting through or what layers are we cutting through and you don't know the answer, Ocular plastic surgeons are very similar when it comes to the layers of the eyelid because they're so well segregated and they're so well defined and visible when you actually do the gross dissection. So that's why I have put Sir Prancelot up here. Okay, the eyelid um, series can be divided up quite nicely. So before we dive in, let's go have a look at our lovely biodigital app again. I'm gonna try and do a new share. Okay, let's hope this works. Okay, new share. Hopefully you guys can see the new screen, hopefully. Okay, all good, fantastic. So when it comes to the eyelid anatomy, okay, we have an upper eyelid, we have a lower eyelid, we have a lateral canthus, okay, some Latin term to mean the angles or the edges, okay, and a medial canthus here where the fleshy pink part is, known as curriculum. Um, and we have superficially obviously skin. So let's get rid of that. That's no, no, no winning answers for the skin as the most superficial layer. What then comes is the orbicularis oculi, okay? A skeletal muscle is the next one below the skin. Obviously with the skin comes the subcutaneous fat, okay? Before you hit the orbicularis oculi, but that is part of the skin kind of serosa. So I'll, I won't count it in here or it's not shown on this app. So we have the orbicularis oculi, okay? And this is a big skeletal muscle that helps ultimately release secretions from the lacrimal gland, which we'll see behind the eye. And it helps eyelid closure from both ends. Can you see it? It's quite circular in nature, so it helps lower eyelid and upper eyelid closure. 
So that's orbicularis oculi. It's supplied by the cranial nerve seven, okay, part of the facial nerve. After that, we have the orbital septum, okay? The orbital septum following the orbicularis oculi is quite an important structure because it's a connective tissue layer that essentially helps to, to help stop the spread of infection going further into the eye or, or orbit. So stuff like preceptal cellulitis and orbital cellulitis are given their definitions based on this anatomical structure, the orbital septum. The orbital septum helps divide a preceptal cellulitis, which you can usually manage at home without any worries, and an orbital cellulitis, which is infiltrated beyond the orbital septum, okay? There is a grading criteria known as Chandler's grading that allows us to grade the level of orbital cellulitis based on how far it has invaded the orbital septum, okay? Let's remove that, no fun, no more fun there. What forms the actual structure of your eyelids are these things called a superior tarsal plate and an inferior tarsal plate, okay? Once again, this is just very dense, regularly arranged connective tissue that helps form the structure for your eyelid. Um, a bit like the connective tissue or the cartilage that's present in your ear, this is a bit like the cartilage equivalent of the eye, but it's a lot softer and it's more connective tissue than cartilage. And on this, we have attachments of various muscle groups. So we have a superior tarsal muscle, okay? The superior tarsal muscle, no points for guessing, helps elevate the lid, okay? And below, we have the inferior tarsal muscle. Once again, no points for guessing, but it helps to lower the lower eyelid, okay? So tarsal plates, and let's get rid of the muscles because we've covered them. Within the actual tarsal plates, we have these beautiful structures, or they look a bit weird, don't they? Um, known as meibomian glands, okay? The eye has a lot of gang glands, which we'll cover, but meibomian glands are some of the most important ones because they help to produce the aqueous layer of tears. And the aqueous layer of tears, sorry, apologies, they help produce the lipid layer of tears, apologies. So the meibomian glands secrete the lipid layer and that prevents your tears from evaporating. The lacrimal gland is the one that produces the aqueous layer of your tears, whereas the meibomian glands produce the lipid layer on top of your tears to help them stop them from evaporating. So they're very important. And quite a lot of dry eye disease is to do with meibomian gland dysfunction. The meibomian glands aren't secreting these lipids, and so they just the tears that are produced by the lacrimal gland evaporate off the eye. Okay, so these guys are really important, and they tend to get blocked up, sadly, um, with time. What else can we show you here? So we've got the lacrimal gland, no surprises there. And we have the lacrimal system, which we can talk about later on, okay? So that's how you dis dissect the eye, okay? Just roughly. So I'm just gonna go back to the PowerPoint. Hopefully you guys can all see that. Um, so those are the various layers of the eye, okay? We, it's a bit like a surgical abdomen. You need to know your layers as you go in, inwards into the eye, okay? And so we have, as we discussed, the skin, and it's subcutaneous fat. We have the orbicularis oculi, uh, which is supplied by cranial nerve seven, and it does global eyelid closure as well as squeezing and emptying of tears out of the eye. Then we have submuscular adipose tissue. Ignore it, it's just fatty tissue that's associated with muscle. So because we have a big skeletal muscle there known as orbicularis oculi, we have a bit of adipose tissue that comes with that. This is quite a popular site for a lot of Botox injections and a lot of reasons why ocular plastic surgeons have lucrative weekend clinics because they Botox inject into this adipose tissue to help either fill things up or reduce um, sunken eyelids, if that makes sense, especially in the lower fat region, okay, of your lower eyelid. The orbital septum is the region that divides the anterior portion of the eyelid and the posterior portion. It helps the stop of spread of infection, okay? If, if you have anything in front of the orbital septum, you have a preceptal cellulitis, anything behind is orbital cellulitis. We have tarsal plates, which are connective tissues that allow the attachment of their respective muscle groups to help the eyelids further up and down, okay? Elevate and de-elevate, that's not a term, but you know what I mean. And then we have this contraption called a levator apparatus, okay, which consists of the superior tarsal muscle, okay? We talked about the tarsal plate, and it consists of the levator palpebrae superioris, okay? The inferior tarsal muscle attaches to the bottom part and it isn't part of the levator apparatus, but I've just included here just for kind of continuity of superior. The two things that are included in this levator apparatus 
is the levator papyrus superioris and superior tarsal muscle. Now, it might be a bit hard to get your head around this initially, but essentially it's important to think about the separation of muscle groups when it comes to partial ptosis and complete ptosis. A complete ptosis, once again, I'm happy to reiterate this at the end of the slides because it is a bit of a difficult concept, but a complete ptosis is when there is total lid shut. Okay, the lid is totally shut. Um, it is defined by less than, I think it's a third of sclera showing. Okay, the white part of the eye, a less, less than a third of sclera showing defines a complete ptosis. And this is usually due to a paralysis of the levator palpari superioris, a skeletal muscle, okay? And a skeletal muscle that is innervated by cranial nerve three indicates there is probably a lesion somewhere on the somatic nerve that is carried by cranial nerve three. So this is quite a sinister sign, okay? Because it can sometimes indicate a space occupying lesion if there is total ptosis, okay? With other parts such as a dilated pupil, okay? So let me repeat that. If there is complete ptosis, this is potentially a red flag sign for a space occupying lesion that is compressing cranial nerve three. Usually it happens in the cavernous sinus where cranial nerve three is very likely to be compressed by a vascular aneurysm or some form of a thrombosis lesion, okay? A partial ptosis is also a red flag sign but by a different pathophysiological mechanism. The partial ptosis is due to the paralysis of this muscle, the superior tarsal muscle, which is also known as Muller's muscle. And Muller's muscle is not skeletal in origin, okay? And it is supplied by the sympathetic chain or the sympathetic fibers that run down the chain, back up, and then hitch a hitchhike on a cranial nerve to get to the superior tarsal muscle, okay? So this is a lesion that could be anywhere that affects the sympathetic chain, either preganglionic, intraganglion, or postganglionic, okay? So this is Horner syndrome, something worth being aware of, okay? All you need to remember is levator palpebrae superioris is skeletal, superior tarsal muscle is sympathetic or autonomically controlled, okay? And there's a difference between a complete and partial ptosis. Other things that go wrong in the eye, just quickly, so styes um, or hordulums, I think they're called also, um, is a focal infection of a hair follicle. You know those sebaceous cysts, sorry, those sebaceous glands that cyst with hair follicles somewhere in the subcut tissue? That is what a sty is. It typically is a collection of pus and not just a connection of benign, non-infective fluid. And so that's why it tends to be painful. It can also be an infection of a meibomium gland, which has been blocked. And as a result, there's some purulent substance and bacteria that have invaded. These typically are staph slash strep in origin because that's your skin commensals. They're painful and they do require treatment, usually with some form of cuterage or topical antibiotics. A calasian, on the other hand, is a focal cyst that is usually related to meibomium glands that are also blocked, unfortunately, but the stuff is not infected yet. They tend to be much larger and usually seen on the inside when you eve that eyelid. They're painless in nature, okay? These are technically man managed conservatively usually, all right? But they can also be managed medically or surgically if required. Okay, the lacrimal system. This is a very simple system. Let's talk it through. I'm going to switch back. I'm going to switch back. Okay, let's have a look. Um, how do I share screen again? Sorry. There we go. Okay. Oh dear, not that one. Let me have a look, sorry. I have to press these links. Um, new share, okay, brilliant. Hopefully everyone can see the desktop thing of, okay, all good, fantastic. So we have a dry eye image or a model at least. Ignore the fact that it's a dry eye, okay? I just wanna show the lacrimal system from here, okay? So let me zoom out a teeny weeny bit. So as you can see, I've dissected away all the skin, the muscles, um, and the various connective tissues, including the orbital septum, all right? In the top right-hand corner, we have the main star of the show, which is the lacrimal gland, okay? This is where we get majority of our aqueous tears, the tears that form the bulk of our tears onto the eye and help lubricate the eye, okay? As well as provide nutrition to some of the epithelial cells on the cornea. 
this lacrimal gland is gently squeezed every time we blink, okay? Every time we blink with orbicularis oculi, the lacrimal gland releases a bit of aqueous into the eye and through a sweeping motion that is very intelligently designed by our eyelashes and eyelids, the liquid goes from top right, okay, almost, to bottom left through a gutter drainage system, okay? And this gutter drainage system then goes into our lacrimal system, which is effectively the gutter works for our eye, okay? So not labeled here is our first conduit of the lacrimal system. Oh, too far in, too far in. Oh dear, okay, too far in. Okay, so up here, hopefully you can see that. Oh dear, this is, this is complicated, okay. Up here we have a hole, okay? This is called a superior punctum. And okay, and down here, we also have a small hole, if you can see that, okay, an inferior punctum. These drain into their respective cannuliculi, okay, cannuliculi being very fancy terms for tracts, okay, or networks. So you've got the superior cannuliculus and the inferior cannuliculus. No surprises, these two merge later on to form the common cannuliculus, okay? And the common cannuliculus, I'm gonna zoom out a bit, Okay, the common cannuliculus forms the lacrimal sac. Okay, and the lacrimal sac is where we house most of our debris. This is a bit like the rectum of feces, effect effectively. It's the, it's the rectum of tears, okay, the lacrimal sac. And then the lacrimal sac forms a narrowing at the bottom known as the laser, nasal lacrimal duct. And that connects up to an inferior turbinate where all our tears are drained. So if you're having a particularly eventful Friday night and you're very tearful, you tend to taste a lot of salt at the back of your mouth because of the fact that the tears that you're producing are firstly salty in nature because it's the type of tears you feel, you feel when you're emotional. And equally, they're draining through the inferior turbinates of your nose into the nasopharynx, which you eventually just swallow that, okay? So that's why you tend to have um taste tasteful tears if you're especially having a good a good um good weep okay let's get back into this where are we back gosh i feel like one of those old age lecturers now that i never wanted to become okay the eyeball okay the cornea let's talk about the cornea super quickly so the cornea consists of five layers there's no rationale behind it really but you can remember it as a b c d e You've got the anterior corneal epithelium or just the epithelium, okay? Epithelium meaning the superficial layer, okay? The Bowman's membrane. Every, every histology slide will always have a connective tissue membrane. So an epithelium or an endothelium will always have a connective tissue membrane. And in this case, it's known as Bowman's layer or Bowman's membrane. Then we have the corneal stroma or just the stroma, which is where the bulk of the con contents is. This is the stroma. As I said earlier, it's very, it's very regularly lined, okay, collagen fibers to allow us to have a clear window into the back of the eye so light can travel without any disruption. If it was irregularly entangled, we would have light not coming through as regularly as we'd like, okay, or we'd see the world in a very different manner. So it's very regular, it's transparent as a result, it's got no vasculature and it's rich in nervous supply. So any corneal problems you ever experience, like a foreign body or corneal ulcers or infections known as keratitis, you will have extreme amounts of pain as a result of it because of the fact that it's very rich in nervous supply. And if it becomes a deep stromal infection as part of a keratitis, like herpes keratitis, you will be in a lot of pain and you'll be photophobic. You wouldn't want to open up your eyes. Then, as we have an endothelium at the bottom, we have a basement membrane that is associated with that, and that's known as decimase membrane, okay? And then we have the endothelium. The endothelium in the cornea is critical. It is this structure here, okay, with its respective membrane up here, decimase membrane, and the endothelium. This is critical because the endothelium here has multiple channels, potassium, sodium, um, ATPases, that help move sodium channel sorry move ions from the stroma out and from this and from the aqueous in to help maintain basically a healthy stroma and cornea so if you have gradual decay of these even if you have intraoperative procedures too many of them or if you have some form of dystrophy okay a corneal dystrophy we call it and you start to lose these bad boys 
we don't regenerate them unfortunately because there are no stem cells in the corneal endothelium and so that is end game for your cornea and it will gradually start to fog up with a lot of water or excess ions or the wrong balance and so you get basically corneal opacities if you have a dystrophy like a corneal dystrophy okay so these guys are very important at the very bottom they're known as endothelium endothelial cells um, a few clinical reminders corneal ulcers okay they usually start as a form of keratitis, but then they can develop ulceration if you start to lose parts of the epithelium and stroma, okay? So they almost form like craters, and that, that just causes the infection to be even more deep-seeded, and they're very painful. Ignore the fact that it says a focal infection of the lacrimal sac, that's completely wrong. <laughs> corneal transplants, these are awesome, they look amazing, and we tend to do different parts of the cornea for transplanting. So worth keeping an eye out for these when you see them on your ophthalmology rotations because you can see all these beautiful sutures but this is a total thickness corneal transplant i forgot what they're called but there's a specific term for them we tend to nowadays do very small ones like dmex which is just the endothelium removed plus a bit of stromum um dsex also and various other things okay so worth being aware of the fact that we can do corneal transplants okay the conjunctiva I'm sorry, I should try and speed up actually, but um, the conjunctiva has multiple parts to it, okay? Unfortunately, I don't have a really good um, anatomical model for this one, but we'll just talk it through. The conjunctiva is effectively a protective layer for the sclera, okay? Remember, we talked about the three layers of the eye, and the most outermost has the sclera, which is this, okay, and the cornea. It would make no sense for a, another layer of something to exist on the cornea because we wouldn't be able to see. We need to keep this window clear. Okay, so the cornea it still exists, there's no extra layer. But for the sclera and parts of the eyelid, there is an extra layer of protection by the conjunctiva. Okay, it is also named according to where it is placed. So the yellow portion the, that covers the white part of our eye, the sclera, is known as bulba conjunctiva. When it inverts on itself and goes back up the eyelid, on the inside of the eyelid, it is known as a fornix, okay, or a corner. And down here, we have new glands that help secrete on top of the conjunctiva to keep our, basically our eye oiled well. And these are the glands of Krauss and Wolfring, okay, quite infamous glands. And they help contribute also to the oily part of our tear film, okay? So they help reduce evaporation from the tear film as well as the meibomian glands which are present here in the tarsal plate um, and then when the conjunctiva folds in on itself and travels down the inside of the eyelid it is known as the palpebral conjunctiva okay so the main point of this slide to take away is the conjunctiva has three distinct segments the bulba palpebral and the fornices okay so don't forget that. It doesn't just cover the sclera, okay? It also covers the inside of the eye. And its main purpose is to maintain eye motility, protect the eye, and stop microbial entry, as well as allow lubrication. Clinically speaking, subtenon blocks are done by pinching a part of the conjunctiva and essentially injecting anesthetic above the sclera into this, poten into this potential space called the tenons capsule. So there's here, not on this diagram, there is a thing called a tenons capsule, and a subtenon block is injection of anesthetic into that local area to allow people to do cataract surgery. So if you've got a particularly squeamish patient who doesn't like topical anesthetic, which is majority of cataract surgery these days, you can do a subtenon block to get a better block as well as a bit of paresthesia for the rectus muscles that move the eye, okay? Or paralysis, sorry. Okay, anatomy of the carotid artery system and its relation to ocular disorders. I despise neuro-ophthalmology as well as strokes and neurology. So I'm going to brush over this as quickly as I can because it's a lot of rote learning, unfortunately, okay? Um, I have no good way of learning this material. Um, the carotid artery system, okay, is needed to be patent throughout because otherwise we suffer from strokes and transient ischemic attacks. The brain's a very metabolically demanding organ and it consumes about 60% 60 60 of the glucose that the liver produces, 20% of our cardiac output, and some other wonderful statistic about oxygen. I think it consumes about a quarter of all the oxygen that we um, take in. It's a very metabolically demanding organ, and as a result, we have a very intricate vascular system to supply it, okay? 
So the branches of the aorta you can remember as ABCs, ABCs, okay? You have the arch of the aorta. Um, on the right-hand side, you have a brachiocephalic trunk. You almost have like the equivalent of a common cannuliculus where you have a bit of artery that's known as the brachiocephalic trunk before there's a further division. Whereas on the left-hand side, we just have the common left carotid artery and subclavian artery. The left-hand side of our body, for some reason of embryology again, said sod this trunk we're just going to go straight away and divide off the aorta there's no point of having this extra segment but it's all to do with embryology and how the heart developed along with the lungs and pulmonary vasculature the branches of the common carotid artery subsequently from left and right um, divide into the internal and the external carotid artery and the branches of the external carotid artery before they enter the actual skull have loads more divisions okay whereas the internal carotid artery enters through the i forgot i think it's called the internal carotid canal or something like that or the carotid canal it enters the skull through that canal and then it forms its subdivisions within the skull okay whereas the eca branches off quite soon before it even enters the skull by the various foramina and i think once again it's a rote learning thing but i wouldn't stress too much because i don't think the duke elder will ask you these kind of questions um be very cruel to say what is the fifth branch of the external carotid artery um, but there's a way of remembering it. Some ancient lovers find old positions more stimulating. So you can just probably do it by um, exclusion principles, okay? Let's see if I can give you guys a quick model. Hopefully this works, let's change. Hopefully, okay. Okay, right, hopefully you guys can see a freakish model. Um, so, right, let's have a look. Gosh, this is much more difficult operating with a laptop than I thought. So here, I've, I've removed the aorta and the major branches, okay? But we have the right subclavian, which forms off the right common carotid, okay? And the right common carotid then, around the carotid sinus, bifurcates into the external and internal carotids, okay? So you have the right external, and it's a bit of a mess from here onwards, but then we have the right internal, which I'm trying not to lie to you guys, does just does not bifurcate at all, if you can have a look at its trajectory, and it just goes in via a canal into the brain to join the anterior and posterior, sorry, the anterior and middle circulation of the, anterior, of the circle of Willis. And the circle of Willis, as you can see from an upside down view, is here, okay? roughly here, and it, majority of it is contributed from the internal carotid artery, which has traveled from the common up here, no branches, and then it branches off here to join the anterior circulation. Whereas the external carotid artery um, has multiple branches um, that gives it to the various parts of the face, essentially. It's the major artery that supplies a lot of the muscles that supply the face and above the shoulder region, okay? Um, the head and neck, sorry, that's what I'm trying to get at, the head and neck. Okay, so I can't talk through all those now just because um, I'd, I'd make a fool of myself, but it's just something worth learning, okay? So, okay, hopefully we're back at it, okay? So, um, knowing the artery supply is considered important by the Royal College for some reason, um, but the importance is primarily because of the various stroke syndromes that ophthalmic complaints can come with, okay? So I'll just quickly repeat myself, anterior circulation, mainly the internal carotid artery and posterior circulation is primarily the vertebral arteries. The vertebral arteries actually come off the subclavian arteries also, just like the common carotid, okay? And then they travel backwards into the spine, up the transverse foramina and up the cervical, kind of the transverse foramina or the cervical section of our spine. They then merge once they get around the pons region into the basilar artery, which supplies various branches of the cerebellum before joining the posterior circulation of the circle of Willis, okay? And disruption to any blood flow along the carotid artery system or the vertebral artery system tends to come from three main mechanisms, okay? Ignore the fact that there's five, okay? I'll explain them. There's thrombosis, okay? meaning there is a local occlusion, okay, through a homogenous growth locally, i.e. an atherosclerotic plaque. 
embolism, which means a homogenous growth of atherosclerosis somewhere elsewhere in the body, such as a venous system in the leg, has suddenly popped off an embolus, okay, a, a, a circulating clot, and that has come to disrupt the blood supply. Or there is a very large hemorrhage, maybe secondary to either friable vessels, because if you're elderly, or an aneurysm that's popped, okay? So there's three mechanisms to how blood flow is disrupted. And then when blood flow is disrupted, we get these various outcomes, infarction, ischemia, okay? And these can be impacted or seen through the eyes because sometimes the eyes form part of your stroke syndromes. Visual, visual problems form part of your stroke syndromes, okay? And the main one that I can comment on is amaurosis fugax, okay? This is basically the equivalent of a TIA of the eye, okay? A transient ischemic attack that has led to transient vision loss or monocular blindness, okay? That is very fleeting in nature, couple of minutes, okay? But seconds to minutes. It's usually described as a darkening or some form of curtain over the vision, okay? Not to be confused with how a retinal detachment is described, which is a gradual curtain that's also following in nature. Um, and it tends to be painless blindness, okay? That's important because there are other painful causes of blindness, okay? And this is essentially a TIA of the eye, okay? So there's been a reduced blood supply to the eye because as we talked through the various circulation, okay, the retinal arteries form part of the anterior circulation of the head, okay, or the brain. And if there is an occlusion somewhere distally or proximally, Okay, that means that the retinal arteries will suffer. And so there's hyperperfusion of the retina. And as a result, we get these manifestations of we can't see temporarily because the retina is not doing its job as much as it'd like to. The retinal arteries that supply the eyeball eventually supply the choroidal vessels that supply the retina. Okay. And essentially, we want to take this seriously because one episode of amaurosis fugax or TIA technically buy you a two-week wait or referral to TIA clinic, or they should be seen within six weeks, I think, is the guidelines, to be honest. So take this seriously. This is like a TIA picture, and you essentially manage it like a TIA, which is control the risk factors, the vasculopathic risk factors, high blood pressure, high lipids, smoking, and dietary changes. You might consider popping them on a low-dose aspirin or clopidogrel if you've um, calculated their has bled score. Okay, make sure they're not at risk of bleeding out. And you have to rule out other reasons for this, essentially what we've called a, new, a, a ischemic attack. And sometimes vasculitis can be a reason for why people have ischemic attacks. Because vasculitis, like, um, like atherosclerosis, causes a narrowing of the blood vessels because of an inflammatory response. So GCA, giant cell arteritis, okay, the most common type of vasculitis that affects the eye, can also present with what is like stroke-like or painless loss of vision. So that's why you want to rule out a giant cell arthritis because it's a form of ischemic attack on the eye. Other things that can occur are stuff like central retinal artery occlusion, which is stroke of the eye, okay? This is a very classical fundus of central retinal artery occlusion. You've got a cherry red spot because the macula, okay, the highest site of, um, of photoreceptors that are cones cones or color photoreceptors i need to check which one's which i think it's cones so the highest center of cones we have in our eye is surrounded around the macula and the fovea okay centralized around the fovea but the macula outside has a double supply of artery okay has a double vascular supply so when we have an occlusion of a retinal artery we still have some supply from the choroid and other vasculature to help support our central vision. Hence, we get this kind of cherry red spot and a gradual paleness surrounding the retina, okay? And sometimes you can actually see evidence of vascular occlusive disease. That's the one, cones then. <laughs> Thanks, Razia. So we have this vascular occlusive disease here that you can see there's kind of silver wiring slash narrowing of the blood vessels here to show that there's kind of ischemic episodes occurring. And then we also have central retinal vein occlusion, okay? This is what I call a pizza-like appearance. It's like a margarita pizza. And when we've got a central retinal vein occlusion, we have all these various dot plot hemorrhages, okay? That looks like a margarita pizza. If it was a branch retinal vein occlusion, it would be a pizza segment, 
okay, a particular segment of either the superior temporal vein or the superior nasal vein or the inferior temporal, sorry, inferior um, temporal vein or the inferior nasal vein, okay? So that's what we can also get. This is a bit like hypertensive disease can particularly exacerbate central retinal vein occlusions, okay? So these are your vascular occlusive diseases of the eye. So we're almost there, we're approaching the end guys, don't worry. So this is a bit of a complicated topic because the physiology of vision is very hard to understand um, and it's quite a long topic, but I will try and do my best. As I said earlier, we need a light source, we need some way of detecting it, and then we need some way of understanding what we're seeing, so some sort of perception so if, so to speak, we have a light source like the uh, Pixar lamp, our retina or our eye is a way of detecting it, and then our brain, our visual cortex is a way of perceiving what we're seeing, okay? And obviously perception is formed not just from the visual cortex, but it's also formed from various other associative areas or associative visual cortices, such as the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe when it comes to recognizing faces, locations, and experiencing pleasant, happy memories, okay? So I'm not gonna teach you guys again that light passes through the eye. Um, majority of the refraction occurs in the cornea, 80%. And when refraction occurs, there is a change in the way the light is, how fast it's traveling and the way it's traveling and in which direction it's traveling, okay? And then the lens does 20% of refraction. So by the time the light from an image hits the retina, it will have essentially been inverted at a focal point. So imagine this is your lens. There's probably a cornea that's in a bit more refraction here. The light, by the point it hits your retina, will have been inverted, okay? So that's important to remember. So you see an upside down image by the time it hits your retina or it's being processed. The retina, okay? Remember, the retina is the most inner layer of the eye, the neurosensory layer, and it's literally just a thin layer of neurosensory cells. They kind of form a circade, it's difficult to describe, they form like this circadic um, pattern, um, this circular pattern, and they all kind of, cent they all centralize around the optic nerve, okay? So thin layer of sheets of various kind of axonal nerves, okay? It's very, very intricate and it's got multiple layers. I think people are still adding on the amount of layers it has. So I think up to 11 have been described so far, okay? It lines two thirds of the globe and terminates at the aura serrata. And the aura serrata is a anatomical structure that sits basically behind the ciliary body. And it's at the interface between here where essentially the retina stops and eventually becomes the ciliary body or the ciliary body takes over as the middle layer of the eye, okay? The two major components I want you to take away from this, sod learning all this, this is probably not necessary and not needed at all, okay? Um, the two major components you need to take away from this is there's a retinal pigmented epithelium layer, which is the one that captures the light and the signal, okay? And then we have the neurosensory retina layer, which does everything else, okay? So we've got the RPE, which is very important, okay? And then we have everything else, which is the neurosensory retina, okay? Once again, metabolically very active. Um, about 80% of the tissue, about 80% of the metabolic products that we need for the eye is consumed by the retina. Um, and because it's so metabolically active, this is why we have such unique design for it, okay? So essentially what happens is when light hits the retina, it travels down all these crappy layers before it gets to the photoreceptor layer, which is what it is actually interested in. Here we have pigmented epithelium in the form of con cones and rods that carry rhodopsin, okay, a type of photopigment that has a very special chemical reaction when light hits it and polarizes it to form some form of new molecule. And as a result, that is how we get phototransduction, okay, or transduction of this um, photostimulus into something else. So that happens at the very bottom. So it's a bit counterintuitive from an evolutionary perspective to have so many barriers before light hits here, okay? Um, so that's the one. Yep, Stephen's right. Um, so they have these various chemicals here, um, and it's counterintuitive for the, from an evolutionary perspective, but this is where the biggest amount of vasculature is, okay? Um, Yasmin, sorry, I just saw your question. Same signs and symptoms with vein and artery occlusion. 
yes and no. You would get basically painless vision loss is the main thing you'd get with both. Um, and a drop in visual acuity, but there'd be different reasons as to why you've suffered one or the other. Okay, but same symptoms. Um, okay, so this is the retina. And you can remember it with this mnemonic, but the main takeaway home message is the fact that the neurosensory retina is everything else. And then you've got the retinal pigmented epithelium as the bottom part, okay? Okay, once again, I'm sorry for the information overload, but we have light that travels through all these various layers, hits the retinal pigmented epithelium, which has very rich supply from the choroid. Remember, the choroid is the second layer, okay, or the vascular tunica, or the tunica vascular, okay? And so that's why most of our vessels are, and so they provide a rich supply to allow these very metabolically active ganglion cells to function, okay? And then the signal gets transduced back up via your photoreceptors, your rods and cones, down to these cells that communicate horizontal amacrine cells and effectively eventually synapse with the ganglion cells, which form this kind of circular pattern in the eye when they release their nerve fibers to go find the optic nerve and the optic um, canal to get back into the brain, okay? So the visual pathway is a bit like this. Direction of light hits the photoreceptors. The photoreceptors send signals to the bipolar cells slash ganglion cells. There's a lot of other cells that modulate the signal, okay, that help modulate the signal. For example, if it's dark, um, if it's more dark, or if you need to pinpoint something in particular, or if you have a lot of stimulus around you, say if you're in a crowd and you need to focus in. There are some intermediate cells before the bipolar cells and after the bipolar cells but primarily to simplify things, this is how it goes, okay? And then the ganglion cells release their nerves um, through the retina and they all traverse to form the optic nerve, um, which gets myelinated as it leaves the eye and through the optic canal, okay? So then we form the optic nerve, okay? Remember that when we form the visual field, as I said, it's been inverted and it's now being sensed by different parts of the retina. So I will show you the picture actually in the next slide, it will come up. Once the optic nerve leaves, um, it leads the optic chiasm, okay, where there is decussation of nerve fibers, okay, where they join up to their various respective temporal fields. And at the optic chiasm, we have the um, optic tracts, which lead to the lateral geniculate nucleus. And from then on, we have connection with the visual cortex. I will show you the picture now. So, sorry, we have optic tract after optic chiasm, but essentially after the visual pathway, we have the, what I meant earlier to say was the temporal field. So the field that we see most uh, lateral, okay, most lateral here becomes and is picked up by the nasal optic fibers. Okay, so they're kind of, there's a transverse, there is a crossover. So the nasal fibers pick up the temporal field and the nasal field is picked up by the um, temporal fibers. Okay, these optic fibers then travel and decussate, or well, sorry, not decussate even, they join their respective fields. So now we have a unison of the temporal as well as the nasal fields, okay, in their respective optic tract. And then they form the lateral geniculate nucleus, where is essentially the, the lateral geniculate nucleus is associated with the thalamus. And the thalamus is a bit like the um, router of the brain and it filters all the signals, okay? And by filtering all the signals, it is able to also modulate from a top-down approach, okay, as to what signals it like to know about. So say, for example, if you're in a crowd and you wanna focus in on, say, someone who's about to chase you down or someone who has a knife, who's an immediate threat, the, the, the lateral geniculate nucleus will help prioritize that signal all, all over all the other debris that might be going in through your visual tract, okay? And just as we learned in medical school, um, tracts and lesions along these tracts will, will create very specific types of defects in terms of our visual field defects. So a lesion on, say for example, at two will cause a unilateral field loss. At the middle, we will have bitemporal hemianopia. At four, we will have a homonymous hem hemianopia, which looks like that. So the tracks are siding with each other on the same side compared to bitemporal bi hemianopia. And at five, okay, when we have a lesion to a specific tract, whether it's the superior or inferior, there will be some element of macular sparing, 
okay? Because of the fact that the macula has a dual supply from the contralateral side, okay? So this is the main tracks and the lesions that cause these tend to be so at two and at four and at five, potentially can be space occupying lesions. But because um, a lot of stroke syndromes affect the anterior circulation more disproportionately, okay, um, a lot of the time more, more peripheral lesions like the four and five tend to be due to stroke syndromes. Three is characteristically due to pituitary lesions, whether they come from a pituitary adenoma or some form of embryological remnant of the pituitary or pituitary apoplexy, which comes after pregnancy. And two tends to be formed through optic nerve compression, secondary when it's traveled through, say, like the cavernous sinus. All right. So these can be stuff like aneurysms and thrombosis, sinus thrombosis, okay, as well as other space occupying lesions. All right, so that's the visual field defects. I will quickly spend one last slide on the anatomy of the extraocular muscles, okay? There isn't much to know about the extraocular muscles and the typical stuff that gets tested is, is mostly their movements, okay? Otherwise, their attachments are quite commonsensical. They tend to be about five millimeters displaced from the actual limbus, okay? Or five to 10 millimeters displaced from the actual limbus of the eye. Um, they attach behind the orbit, okay, behind the orbital septum, and in particular, the superior oblique um, has a trocular-like action when it comes to movements, okay? But a good way of remembering the movements of the extraocular muscles is a very good mnemonic that wasn't my own. Someone else told me about it. And essentially, if you remember the childhood Disney song or Disney playlist um, or movie even, Sinbad, there is a nice mnemonic, Sinrad Obabinix, okay, which is a good way that I've remembered since then because it's just so absurd of how these muscles work, okay? So every time you sit an exam and you have to remember how these extraocular muscles work, you have to always remember that they all have three essentially movements, okay? There are six muscles in total, okay? We have the superior rectus, inferior rectus, the superior oblique, inferior oblique lateral rectus and medial rectus. The reason I haven't included the medial rectus or lateral rectus is because they're quite commonsensical, okay? The medial rectus um, abducts as well as, um, it doesn't do anything else, it doesn't do any depression. It does a tiny bit of extortion, okay? And the lateral rectus, um, sorry, the, the lateral rectus does abduction, a bit of extortion, and the medial rectus does abduct, adduction, um, movement towards the eye and a bit of intorsion, okay, a tiny bit, and it doesn't do any elevation or depression. The others are a bit more complicated, which include the superior oblique, inferior rectus, infer sorry, superior rectus, inferior rectus, superior oblique, and inferior oblique. And a good way to remember it is the superiors intort, sin, the recti muscle adduct, the oblique muscles abduct and the inferiors extort. So when you've got this mnemonic sorted, okay, you can basically fill in a table to help you decide their secondary and tertiary movements, okay? And so when a question asks you a collection or series of movements, you're able to know what muscle is either overactive or underactive, depending on the type of movements you're seeing or gazes, okay? So superior rectus is one that follows the rules. So it, as the name suggests, it will elevate the eye, okay? And because we know about the sin part, okay, and it's a superior muscle, it will intort. And because we know that it is a rectus muscle, rad, it adducts. So it elevates, adducts, and intorts. And we can fill in that table. Inferior rectus is also the same. It follows the rule in terms of its name. So it does a depression because it's at the bottom pulling the eyelid down. But from the mnemonic here, Sinrad or Babinix, we know that the inferior rectus will extort and it will adduct. And so we know depression, adduction, extortion is what the inferior rectus does, and so forth, so forth. The superior and oblique and inferior oblique are a bit, a bit unusual in the sense that despite them being called the superior oblique, um, and the inferior oblique, they do the opposite of what they're supposed to. The oblique muscles are slightly odd in that way. 
the way superior bleak attaches is dictates the way it does the depression but i can't really explain it that well to be honest at this current stage but they used to describe it as almost a hand movement that kind of looks down like that that's the kind of superior bleak movement but it's difficult to explain that <laughs> so you just i i to be honest wrote learned to, that superior bleak does the opposite of what it's supposed to it depresses unlike its counterpart superior rectus and then because we know it's superior and it's oblique it does intortion and abduction same with inferior rectus because it's counterintuitive to its actions it elevates and because it's an inferior oblique it's inferior it extorts and it's oblique it abducts all right so that is that and more on the extraocular muscles and how they relate to cranial nerve palsies we'll discuss in the neuroophthalmology module, okay? Or the neuroophthalmology lesson, all right? So, thank you everyone for the whiz tour of anatomy. I'm sorry for the craziness. There is another MCQ just so we can go through and I will send everyone with the right answers so you can feed back to yourself um, to make sure that you've got the right answers. But if you have a go at this quiz, I can have a quick look. And I'm also happy to answer any questions you guys might have at this current stage. I'm just gonna have a quick look at my 